Well, frankly, um, I'd almost just rather listen to Coldplay. Uh, what a beautiful song, and I want to thank uh, Coldplay for offering us the music today via YouTube. So, um, really, really enjoy listening to Coldplay, but I think uh, maybe more so what you came here uh, to do was to learn a little bit about uh, closing bookings over the phone. And this was a topic that I presented uh, multiple times in my career. It's something that, um, that as I've grown up around cells uh, here at LiveRails, I've come to realize that there fundamentally is a few things that seem to just work. And these aren't some um, tips from Zig Ziglar or how to win friends and influence people or whatever those books are. This is how to fundamentally just some some things and fundamentals and best practices that property managers can use and share to work with, um, that property managers can use and share and work with different uh, folks in the reservation department to help their businesses. And so this is, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, just for your indication, we will be, uh, just so we can start on a couple of housekeeping notes, we will be recording this. And so these and the slides and the presentation will be available on LiveRest.com shortly after this today. And uh, we'd love to get that zipped up for you and have those available so you can take some of these fundamentals back. There's some great takeaways here. Um, I would feel free to write down notes. Um, there's no royalty fees for those. And uh, I'm joking. But uh, this is a great topic. Now, there is – I want to make the point also for, for those of you who are attending the VRMA annual conference in San Diego – uh, we are actually will be presenting this topic, but an expanded version of this topic, actually seven fundamentals, and adding a couple of points to this. So please think about attending that. It will be better that we hand out some really, really great stuff. So let's go ahead and just start discussing our topic here today, the five fundamentals of closing bookings over the phone. Now, just to introduce myself, I'm Tyler Hurst. I work with LiveRest.com. Um, I've been here for seven years. I'm the director of sales and marketing here. And I uh, want to thank each one of you for taking some time out of your day to join us. And uh, I, I hope and I think that this will be meaningful. And I think that you'll get a lot from it, be able to take something home to your staff. All right, so let's talk for a second about maybe what we want to get into here. Is I want This presentation is really about how to effectively close bookings over the phone, to become a more efficient salesperson, and how to generate more business. That's overall the goal of this presentation. Now, <laughs> we're going to do that by talking about five fundamentals. And let's explain what those five are, and then we'll tear into one of them, one of each one of them one by one. First of all, training, training, training. Um, we'll talk about this a lot, but training is fundamentally very, very important to just, and it doesn't have to be hardcore, read a book. It's it can be, you know, listening in on others. It can be, um, I know that there's some really great managers out there, and I got a lot of advice uh, from some really great property managers along the way. But um, one property manager said that they would almost kind of like listen in on phone calls and then just kind of almost check in with them and kind of listen and say, you know, you could have done this better, that better, and do it all in a very positive manner. Most of the time we know what we're doing. We all know how to answer the phone. We know how to how to interact with people as professionals, but there's some things that you can do to really actually make quite a big difference. Training so is certainly important. Don't forget the basics. We're going to talk about what some of the basics in the industry are, um, things that maybe we sometimes overlook or get away from that are standards, and then we set it in place and in motion, and then sometimes it changes. So let's look at that. Then we're going to take a moment to talk about gathering information and how crucial that can be, not only in the initial sales process, but what you, for your long-term goals for your company. Uh, we'll talk about um, overcoming objections. That's also very, very important. And how to overcome the common objections and what those common objections are. And certainly, your common objections are going to be different than someone else's common objections. And so, uh, being able to understand those, don't shy away from those. You should have a board in your office it says these are common objections and like know those and talk about those and and say it, it could almost be a game and how to overcome those objections and, and reward people for that. And this is a really, really fun idea. But what's what's wrong with just going back to the to the basics and just saying, yeah, these are the objections we get. How how do we overcome them? And sometimes, you know, these individuals who work with you, these reservation agents, they just need to be able to have the answers to go with and the tools to overcome those objections. And that's, that's upon the principles of the company to, to really help provide those. 
and to help them to see that. Now, certainly the principals of the company are interested in getting as many reservations as possible. So uh, we'll talk about that today also. And then also solar hold. It's a really great concept of if you can't get it sold, and, and how to really close on a sale. But if you can't get it sold, how do we get them to put it on hold? And I'll tell you a story about that also. So one of the things that I want to start with is just talking about training, training, training. And, and we have some really fun stuff today. I actually have some example sound clips uh, from some phone calls that were good and not so good. Uh, some that will make you laugh. And if you want to go ahead and type in your laughter, uh, just as a point, you can ask questions throughout the seminar uh, today in the toggle on your right hand side of your window uh, in the gray box it should say questions to be able to type questions we will answer all of those questions at the end today but if you're kind of like if you have some reaction to what we're gonna these clips we're gonna say I'd be interested to hear what that is also throughout and it will kind of play community and have fun with that so let's talk for a second about training now one of the keys to training that I, I actually really like and I think people are kind of like they're nervous about this uh, for some reason but it's role playing, and, and most of the mentors in my life that I've learned a lot from is, and I say, well, how do I handle this situation? And I'm, I'm, I like to think that on a lot of levels, I, I would listen to that and want to go through that process. Is this how how to role play? And it's it's not necessarily this kind of role playing, <laughs> but more so maybe this kind of role playing, like practice makes perfect, and. Role playing is really, really important, and the reason why it's fun is because it really, it, it really ties you together. It, it releases all, it takes away the vulnerabilities that you have with your employees, and really, and on some level, kind of almost bonds you together as friends, and that they understand what your current concerns are and how to overcome those. And I think as you go, as if you're a reservationist on the call today, as you go to your principals and say, could we role play some of this out? and try and figure out how they would answer the question or answer the objections or the best practices to pick up the phone, right? For instance, if you have a company um, policy on how the phone is to be answered, then maybe role play that out, right? Because there's more to it than just the words you use, but also voice inflection and tone can make a big difference. Knowing your inventory is also a very crucial part of the training process. Um, this is this is a this is an exercise that you should certainly do with all of your reservation agents. Is send them out and you know part of the training is send them out into the homes. I, I don't know how far you want to take that. I've seen some managements who will they, they some management companies. Here's a takeaway. Okay, here's a nugget, something to consider. But they'll team up with other managers, maybe even their area or maybe an hour away, and make them for free. They'll just trade off and make them just go through the whole process of making a booking, calling in, and trying to understand really what the guest is thinking. Put them in the guest's shoes. And, you know, searching the internet and trying to find that management company, calling in, seeing what they liked, what worked well, and, and what didn't. One of the biggest compliments that, that we received um, recently is that we, we've, we're working on, as some of you know, we had the Live Rest Partner Conference uh, here in Boise, and we did a lot of social media around that. And I had another organization, another planning group, um, that we work with also reach out and be like, you know, we got this idea from you guys. You guys have done a really good job with this. And that was a really great compliment to our marketing director, Rob Holderness, that he did a really great job. But we we work off each other. You know, diamonds sharpen diamonds on some levels. And so knowing your inventory, sending them out, letting them understand uh, the inventory, and we're going to look at a really good example of that right now. Knowing your inventory is very, very crucial. And I want you to listen in on this call. This is an actual phone call, call that happened. Now, let me let me reset that. This so let me set this up. This is an event, an actual phone call that happened for property manager. A guest called in, and we have a recorded copy of this call. And I want you to listen in that how well this management individual really could talk about. I mean, guest is probably on the phone or something to that extent, and really really talk about the property very very well and how much confidence they have. But then you have to consider how do we get our property managers to that. How do we get our reservations to that position? Let's go ahead and listen in. Three of these homes are located in the Coburn Seaside, which is the south, south end near about 20 minute walk downtown. Um, which is actually on the list. It's going to be 820 Columbia. It's going to be a brown house. Um, or the 2431 Ocean Vista? Yeah, 2431 Ocean Vista is going to be in the Cove. 
So it's 2375 Ocean Vista and 2360. So all the Ocean Vista homes are going to be one house off the ocean. Oh, okay. Outside, okay. Oh, but the 820 uh, Columbia is, you were saying? That house, that house is about a five-minute walk from downtown. So that's about two blocks from downtown and then three houses off the ocean. So you don't have the ocean view, but you have, you've just stepped away from uh, downtown. The other ones are within walking distance of downtown, no problem. But depending on what you got going on, if you need to be at the convention center or Now, I know that was kind of hard to hear, but what did he say? He was like, well, this one is ocean view. It's actually blocked from the ocean. And then the other one was, then the other one was something like, well, this one is actually a five-minute walk of downtown, but depends on what you're going on. You don't have the ocean view. And he could speak, I mean, just readily. He could readily speak about each one of these units. And the guy was like, well, what about this one? And he answered the question immediately. He didn't even have to know. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that you need to know every detail about every house. But kind of knowing the location and where they're at can make a massive, massive difference and can really help you out and help your guests feel the confidence. I mean, have you ever have you ever called someone? I guess this is something to consider, but have you ever made a phone call to someone and they're like, yeah, I don't know about this, but would you like to buy it anyways? And it's like it, confidence is, is so very, very important on sales calls is just knowing what you, you know and knowing what you don't know and really highlighting what you know well. And so, you know, if someone asks a question, it's showing extreme confidence in that you're, you know what you're talking about and that it's the truth. And, those, and one of the things that, that I'll say also, and then we'll move on to this point, is that being, um, having authentic understanding, and this is something I've kind of come to learn and love about my job, is that being authentic matters so much more. And so when I say, you know, whatever I, it is that I would say about the software that I sell, I know it to be true because I've seen it work and I've seen it help people. And so it's kind of like if you can be authentic and say, you know what, I know that this is a beautiful house and you will really, really enjoy your time here, that really comes off as authentic and people really understand that, that, that you mean that you're being honest with them and that really, really shows well and really gives them that sincere confidence. So talking about training, one of the other things that's important to training is understanding your demographics. And that means, you know, who you're, where they're coming from, why they're coming, right? That certainly matters, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. Is it a male or female? What age? And so, like, for instance, uh, if you're calling into Destin, Florida, which is an amazing area, and, and it's during spring break week in there, then you know that you're looking for a demographic of anywhere from, I don't know, anywhere from 18 to 25 is your demographic, and it's probably going to be males or females, college students, so there's a money consideration that you have to consider there and you know that they want to be have beach access they probably will book online they like the mobile devices and so you have to kind of pay attention to that where something like the vacation on the villages is probably more of a retirement community uh, you get the retired folks going in so they may not book in line but they maybe have more money and they're looking for a longer term business so if you can understand your demographics of who books during what segments of time can make a massive difference for you and, don't, and then, once again, it's understanding their vacation rental experience, like I mentioned earlier. Understanding, like, that the experience of vacation rental, this is just not a booking. So I, I guess the question I would have, and, and it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a question, but how many of your reservations agents have ever went and stayed in a vacation rental? How many of them have ever went through the booking process? How many of them have ever called in or had a maintenance question or a distance question? I know that I have. And I, I know that that really helps me to refine the process. I love when I'm actually booking. And um, I, I love when going through the booking process and really kind of understanding how the guest feel of things. And it really makes a big difference for me. So helping them understand the experience, whether you do some sort of trade or put them in one of your units or something like that. But really, um, I, I think it really helps. But I think the thing is with positive, with training, is I think positivity really can push in the right direction is to give positive feedback. Listen in. Take the time. If you're a principal, take the time to listen into a call every once in a while, and be consistent about that. Because I think that if they, and once I said, if there's an objection or something that didn't get overcame quite the way you want, discuss it and just say, you know what, I would have probably said it like this, or maybe you can consider these as options, or maybe next time if you have to do it like this, what would you do? To really continually to help sharpen your your tools of your reservation agents. Now, some things can get taught, but some things, as we know, are innate. Being friendly, energetic, and excited 
for the win are certainly things that you want to consider, not necessarily this guy. Um, sign on the line. It's going to be great. But the, the point is, is that you're going to, when you're hiring, you, and I, you really kind of almost know sometimes. They walk in the door and you see that bubbling personality and you, they're friendly and they, they ask you questions and they integrate into the conversation. Well, what are you coming for? You know, why did you start this business? And so these kinds of questions, it, it, some, some of that's just innate and just can't be taught. And, and I've heard that from lots of property managers that there's a certainly sometimes when you're hiring, there's a profile. Right, and you have to think about what their phone voice is going to be like. What's their phone personality when you're hiring someone? Now, one once again, staff is the key, and I think it's incredibly important that we realize that that these folks are your people, and and they're the ones, they're the front line guys, the the foot soldiers of your business. And so, you know, I don't know necessarily, and I, I don't. These are just ideas that property managers have given me this, but. But what you also have is, you know, you have the idea of create, creating some sort of commission plan. I've seen commission plans like we'll give you a percentage of every booking or if we hit a certain goal. I was in an organization recently where they, if they hit a certain goal, they would all get a commission or a bonus. Uh, make it a com – I've also seen like competitive competition like total dollars booked or total nights booked and the person who gets the highest wins a prize or highest based on hours gets a prize. And then also, like I said, achievement level bonuses, where if you hit certain levels, um, then there's a bonus or something like that. So these are these are ideas that can keep your folks um, kind of, I mean, certainly they're working for you, and there's certainly I agree that they're paid to work there. But keep them on in your wheelhouse and keep them, you know, hungry for the sell and hungry for the win. And, and you'll continue to see that they'll come to work motivated every day. And motivated for the right reasons, and that's because they love your company and they want to do best by you, and they want to give people a great vacation. And once again, that comes from being authentic and understanding what a great vacation is and relating to some of their experiences on a great vacation. All right, <clears throat> we're going to hurry through this, but the basics. Let's talk about what some of the basics were. This is point number two here. Um, first of all, pick up the phone. And, and I know that that's crazy, but sometimes we call folks, and I, I certainly, even in a booking mode, and the, it's just not getting answered. And I, I, it's the middle of the day. I, I honestly am stubbed for words because it happens. Now, first of all, let's just work off the assumption. Number one, inbound phone cards are gold. They're golden. They're your golden opportunities. They, you've got to do everything you can to answer every single phone call that comes into your business. And that means that maybe if you have to have a plan between five and eight, maybe you have a you know, you don't get quite as many phone calls. Maybe you have a plan to handle that. Maybe you have an 8 to 12 plan and a 12 to 8 the next morning plan. You're 60% more likely to close them if you pick up the phone on the first call. If you miss a call, you get back to them right away. Don't wait. And here's why. This is a chart that was done by Inside Sales, and this is true. This is so incredibly true. Look at the diminishing value. The response time from creation of lead from initial calls that become qualified leads. Within one hour, within one hour to the two hour mark, your numbers go down significantly. And by the way, the golden number is honestly about 15 minutes. If you can, if you miss a call, 15 minutes. You gotta call inbound leads back within 15 minutes. But look at the first hour versus the second hour and the third hour. And what's happening here? Well, number one, they don't feel that you're responsive. They don't necessarily trust that if there's a problem on a vacation that you're going to be responsive. And then thirdly, they're going to shop somewhere else. And the first guy who picks up the phone sometimes or allows them to spend their money is, is certainly going to get that business on some levels. Conversion is six times higher if you call them within the first hour. Six times. So I, I don't know if I can stress this enough. You have got to pick up the phone. And if you can't, and I understand that this happens, we get busy, there's staffing issues, all kinds of things happen, then you've got to call them back. This is basic A1, number one, most important thing you can do. Answer the phone. Now, one of the other ones is if you can't answer the phone, make sure your, your voicemail is professional. I've heard a myriad of great voicemails, you know, that sound professional. Maybe it's using a um, – I've also seen these um, VoIP services that have, like, these call systems that aren't, ex that aren't expensive at all for just a few dollars a month, literally a, a handful of dollars a month. You can create up a voicemail that almost it's like it's almost like a fake 
uh, phone system, and then it allows them to dial a number, and then it dials someone's cell phone or their office phone. So make sure you have a professional voicemail. Check your voicemail. Make sure it's amazing. Forward it if you can. If you're not available and you can't pick up the phone and you're out of the office. Now, I understand. Some of some property managers are not these massive companies with 13 reservation agents, and that's great. That's okay. I love the small business, and I love businesses and guys who are trying to get on their feet, but I understand that sometimes you're checking a property or you're dealing with a customer concern or you're out renting something else to a guest or you're in a meeting. That happens, but forward the phone if you can so that it's getting picked up. If, it's, if you're out of the office, forward it if you can. Make sure you get those phone calls. Next, build rapport. When, when you're on the phone with them, be excited for them. Be ex sincerely excited for them and their vacation. I, I love the idea of sharing, like I said earlier, sharing your experience and building excitement. And that means, you know, and, and once again, this is a role play. And I would probably start something like, oh, Mr. Jones, you're coming in to stay in Sun Valley. You know, I love that house. I went and toured that house when I first started. It has such a great hot tub, and you're just going to love the pool table. And it's got this wonderful um, wet bar in there and the big TV. And you're going to, what are you coming for? Oh, to watch the Broncos game. That's fantastic. You know, you're going to love it. It has surround sound. The couch is wonderful. The kitchen's right next door. But that's being excited for their vacation. And you're like, you're building this imagery in their head of what their vacation is going to be like. And they're like, so they're kind of going along with you on that little tour of visual images through their mind. And then at the end, you're just going to ask them for their booking just to get it finished up. Let's secure this little tour that I've taken you on. Right? And then be professional. But don't be a robot. Be human. And what I mean by that is we have a, I, I consider myself to be fairly professional, but I'm also the guy I, I, I consider myself to be extremely human. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. But I, I like the idea of having personality, sharing your opinion, sharing your experiences with people, always being positive and professional, though, always, always, always being positive. I want to share an example of maybe something that wasn't so good. Turn up your mics or turn up your speakers for this one. You're not going to want to miss this. And I, I want to get your uh, feedback in the question box. And I've noticed a couple people put it in. You're going you're gonna to love this. And this is a true phone call that I got my hands on. Uh, we'll leave the source and the names out of it. But I want you to listen in. And this is a terrible, terrible example. Turn up your speakers for this one. This is great. This is Leah. Hey, Leah. Hi. I apologize. I have been so far behind today. Um, can I call you back in about an hour? Um, actually, I'm going to be leaving. Yeah, I can wait. I'll keep it my cell phone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. Sorry, my boss is in the back room watching Lost, and there, I, I dare not interrupt that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks. So what went right on that phone call? Well, I like Leah. She sounded nice. And she did a really good job on the phone. Um, she did a really good job on the phone being professional and very and, – and she had a really good voice pitch. What went wrong? First of all, she said, I'm really swamped. Can I call you back? And, and you know what? That's actually acceptable um, to say, hey, you know what? I can't get to this right now because I'm doing this. And people understand that. But where she went, where it went terribly wrong, is where she said, "The reason I can't call you back is because my boss is in the back watching Lost." I mean, guys, did anyone chuckle? <laughs> like, I when I gave this presentation, it was in an open. I mean, everyone was like, there were people dying on the floor, and they're just like, "Are you kidding me?" Right? And I'm not making fun of anyone here. I'm just saying that's not acceptable. And that's not gonna that's not gonna work. And so we really want to make sure that when we're doing this, that we're very thoughtful about what we're saying and being, you know, being thoughtful about the ripple effects of what we say and thinking about the company lines there. But saying, yeah, I and the guy's like, well, I kind of okay. You know what? You can call me on my cell phone. I'll I'll help you out. And that would have been the end of it, and it would have been okay. It would have been great, but it would have been okay. But then she's like, well, let me tell you why. It, there, I. My boss is watching Lost, so something to something to think about. <laughs> now, let's talk about the anatomy of a phone call for a second. What is, what is the structure of a phone call? So the phone rings. What do you what do you do? Do you guys have this? Do, that's the question I have. Do you have an anatomy of a phone call? Do you have kind of a system process that should go through? 
Well, my first guess is, and my thought is, the first thing you should ask is what's your name and phone number and email address so that I can get back to you if the phone gets disconnected. People ask that question on the phone during support calls all the time. There's a reason. They want to give you good support. Two, get right into it. Ask them the questions because what happens is you've got to take control of this call. You've got to ask for the dates, location, budget, size of group, type, and the reason of the stay, right? And then, and then that helps you. Because now you've gathered some information that can help them. So you start sharing. Right, well, we have this home. Or what are you, is there any homes you're currently looking at? Oh, this home. But you know what? You might like this one also. And that gives you the opportunity for the upsell. And then you start building their, you start building their vacation. So tell me, you're coming in. Uh, yeah, I'm coming there on Thanksgiving. This is the role play. Uh, yeah, me and my sister and her family and all my family. So it's going to be eight of us total. We need five bedrooms. We need a big kitchen. Is there a place, is there one nearby a store? So this is what I'm getting. And I say, well, actually, you know, this one looks really great. And here's why this one would be great. You know, it's close to here. And if you're going to watch football on, on, on Thursday afternoon, watch this. And you're building that vacation with them. And then you give, once again, you've kind of gone that path, down that path of where you can say, now, do, do you want to buy? You know, do you want to book it? And we'll talk about that. And then very, very lastly, you got to consider – uh, vet your, save your own time and vet the tire kickers. And what I mean by that is you have to be able to kind of know if people are like, hey, we just thought we'd check in and just see if you have any good deals on vacation rentals. I was looking on Craigslist. You know what you're getting. And so you have to almost kind of be aware of those guys. And I'm not saying that we give them bad service because it gets to my next thing. You know, you got to investigate. And, and that means – you know, find out how they found you. Identify what they're talking about, what their goals are, what their purpose of the trip is. And then don't be fooled, though, with assumptions. Sometimes we're wrong about our assumptions. And I, I have been, certainly. I've thought, I've, wanted, I've thought to write things off, but I never do because I work off this idea of, you know, I'm always going to give it the 100%. And I've thought to myself, man, I just, this is going nowhere. And then I get fooled and it turns into something really great. And that's, that's almost embarrassing. Uh, internally, like in my own mind, but I'm saying I'm always thankful that I never wrote anybody off, right? And so, once again, don't be fooled by your quick assumptions, and you know, and that's when you hear if you hear reservationist or if you are reservationist, I'd be very careful about passing judgment quickly on a deal, um, and and just say you know, and staying positive internally about it, and saying yeah, this is this is really good, or this is this person called in. We think this could turn into this. I, I would kind of err to be on the positive side than anything. Which, by the way, if you're if you are a reservation, so in some levels you are a salesperson, and positivity really, really plays well in sales. It, it just keeps the morale high, and and that's something you want to always watch out for is making sure that you have really positive interactions and keeping everyone happy and cheerful, so they they're exuding that through the phone. All right. Gathering information, and, and that gets to the point that, that selling is not telling. It's listening. It's listening and giving information. It's not sales pitches or some fancy lines or some trite statements. Selling is really listening and giving answers, and so let's talk about that. It comes from understanding the guest and really trying to understand what their needs are and what they're really looking for in their trip, and then finding their needs and filling it. So, for instance, I need – as our example earlier, I need a kitchen to cook Thanksgiving dinner. Well, then you're going to – so I'm telling you my problem, and you're going to fulfill it with a need. There's an old, there's an old adage in sales that if you find their need and we fill it, everyone gets rich, right? And it's a joke, but it's a point that people buy things because they need things. I go into Staples to buy paper because I'm out of paper. I go in there and buy a printer. I wouldn't have walked in the door if I didn't have the intention to buy something. Right. If I'm looking at something, it's because I want to buy something. Whether I buy it that day or not, I don't know. But I want to buy something. And so we need to realize that every phone call is a potential revenue for us. So once again, selling is not telling. And that means that sometimes we have to listen in and check. And that means by listening and check, I say <clears throat> someone says, yes, you know, we're, we're coming in because we want to watch the Lions game. Okay, um, so you're coming in and you want to watch the Lions game on Thanksgiving. That's awesome. Now, are you going to the game or are you going to watch it on TV? Oh, no, no, of course. We're going to watch it on TV. 
Oh, okay, perfect. And do you have a specific, you know, TV size you're looking for, a specific number of seats in the living room for the game you're looking for, or any other needs? Well, we watch it as a family, and there's 15 of us, so we'd really like a big living room. Okay, awesome. Well, we have a perfect house for that. It comes from listening. It comes from digging in and caring and really showing sincerity and saying, okay, and thinking, thinking smart and being on your toes. But then also get information for now and later, and that's why we want this information. As I said at the very onset of this is we want the information for uh, the future. What information do we want? The name? the phone number, email, dates, home size, type, proximity, and then most importantly, why are they coming? That's, a, that's not a standard question because usually, I mean, for instance, your software may not ask that. Why are you coming? But if you know that, you can fulfill the needs. Well, I'm coming for Oktoberfest. Okay, well, what you may not know about Oktoberfest is it's here and you need a house with this proximity. Right? They may think, they may say, oh, I want to come to Helen, Georgia, and they may rent a house that's 34 miles away in the mountains because you're centrally located in Helen. They thought that that house would be close. Well, no, you probably don't want that house. You probably want this one. And people, by the way, by doing that, people, you gain so much trust with folks and rapport. It's fantastic. But why? Why gather this information? Number one, it helps you to understand their needs. Two, it allows you to follow up immediately with that information and be able to get back with them. And then three, for future marketing. You just gained a tremendous amount of information that you can use in the future for these folks. And you can market to them and sell them your organization and maybe get them to come in a different season and email blasting, et cetera. Really great opportunities with it. If you have the information, you can use it. If you don't, you can't. All right. This is a fun one for me, overcoming objections. Now, let's, let's talk about this because this they're different in every business, and I would hope then on some levels, you would, if you don't already, have a meeting for 15 minutes and say, just get, just huddle up. It doesn't have to be formal. Just huddle up and be like, what are some of the common objections? And just write them down. And then just go and think about it and say, what would I say? What, if you were the principal, what would you say in this situation? How would you expect your reservations to react to these objections? So I think that's the question is you have to ask yourself, what are your most common objections? Right? Because, for instance, if you're a condo tell in, let's say, Destin, Florida, and you have a really, really nice condo suite, and someone's like, well, I didn't really know it was a hotel. I really wanted a house. The answer to that is it's not a hotel, and we have condos that are just as good as a house, if not better, bigger, and then you don't have to, and you have better parking, and you have beach access, and you have amenities and concierge services. There's, a, there's an objection that, if understood, can be overcome. So... And I guess this, I, I, this is rhetorical, but how many of you have ever asked that question? What are the common objections? Like I hear this one. I have to ask my spouse or other guest. I, I'm just going to shop the rates. Uh, do you have any competitive discounts? I love this one. Why is a cleaning fee so much? As people start to migrate out of hotels and into vacation rentals, there's questions. Why is there a booking fee? Why is there a minimum night stay fee? Now, interestingly, you need to be able to come up with answers for every one of those. As you know your common objections, your reservationists should have tools to overcome these. Period. They, they just should. And, th and this is a really great thing to go through so that you understand maybe how they're going through. And if you're listening in on phone calls, you should have a pulse on this either way. But this is a really, really great idea. And I, and I really like the idea of just talking about this as a company. But this comes from, once again, listening, right? Acknowledge if there's an objection or a problem, listen. Don't – one of the things that maybe I'm good at is my wife, if she has an <clears throat> objection or a <clears throat> problem, um, and I joke, I, I said it with a big smile on my face, sometimes I'm very quick to just answer instead of listening the whole way through. And I joke, but the funny thing is, is that if I listen, then I totally understand the full breadth of the problem or the objection – and then this will help us to build rapport, build trust, and then show that we've actually listened to them and identified their concern. It shows that we actually care by saying, oh, okay, so what is your problem? Well, I need to talk to my spouse. Okay, uh, or my other guests. How many other guests are there? Oh, six. And when do you think they would want to decide on this? Oh, probably by tonight. Oh, okay, well, I can live with that. Or here's my direct phone. If I'm not in the office, here's my cell phone so you can get a hold of me because I know we had an ongoing conversation. 
Now, certainly if your folks are on some sort of commission or bonus plan, they might be willing to do that. But it shows that you listen to that you sincerely care. Tactics to overcome over objections. There's a few tactics that you can use, and these are that, that it's that toolkit that you want to provide your reservationist to overcome. And it's the number one create urgency. Well, this is the last one of this type. I know that you really wanted this, and and I'd rather I'd rather kind of get it zipped up so we don't lose it because the first guy who books it is going to get this. You know, that's great. Um, you know, that's awesome. Maybe, you know what, if we gave you, um, and it's not necessarily a discount, but you could say, you know, what if we gave you 5% off just to get this zipped up now? And you know what, that works sometimes. Okay, you know what, sure, let's just do that. Or, you know what, um, I, I'm concerned that, you know, that my rates may go up where we have a new rate structure coming, something to that extent. Um, how about this? You know what, let's do this. If you stay three, we'll give you one night free. Would that work for you? You know, it shows that you're trying to work with them, and that's what I love to say to people. I just love to be honest with them and say, you know what, let me see what I can do. I, I'd love to just work with you and find a way to get this done. What, what would it take? And that's a great question to take, to ask, what would it take? What would it take? Because if you need approvals, if you're a reservationist or if you are a reservationist and you need approval and you need to go to your boss or supervisor, you probably ought to know what it's going to take so you know what to go and get and whether you want to go there or not. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Extras and amenities. Those are sometimes those are a really great way to get a booking closed that doesn't cost a lot of money. You know what? How about I throw in a food basket? You know what if I threw in a late checkout or waive the pet fee? Right? And that comes from the extras and amenities and then the fee free add ons. Well what if I what if I just said, you know what, you can have a late checkout on Sunday. Your flight's not until five. Airport's only fifteen minutes away. What if I said, you know what, usually it's eleven, but what if I said you could leave at one? Right, kind of work with them within your own parameters that you set. But tactics and tools are very, very important to overcome objections. If they're on the phone, if you remember what I said, if they're on, if they're in the store, they're there to either buy something or they're there to look at something they want. Now, I want to, I, I, I want to remind everyone before we move to number five that if you do have questions, I do want to answer those, and we can kind of almost have a conversation amongst ourselves if you want. This has been a fun presentation for me, and we're almost dipped up with it. But if you have questions, we'll certainly answer that. And then I will also explain to you where we can uh, provide these slides. So let's talk about five. I like this one, sold or hold. Hopefully you've heard that expression before or something similar to it. And it's the idea that you want to close the deal. You've got to close the deal at some point. Right. And one of the things that we and, – and, and it's, I, I think it comes from youth maybe. I don't know. Or maybe not being in this position. Position, we don't have to be hardened sales guys to literally ask, how would you like to pay for that? Okay, but the thing is, it's interesting, I'm going to talk about this, is we've got to close these deals. We can't just say, we're not, on some levels, are we order takers? And sometimes we are, and that's the way it should be. Are we order takers, right? Or are we, are we salespeople on some levels? Or vacation planners, which I like that term also, I've heard that, right? Well, funny thing is, is this is, this is the key here. Of everything we've talked about, you got to ask for the sell. Yeah, you, you've got to ask for the sell, and that comes from this. If you complete all the por portions of the, if we go back to the call anatomy, going through the process, picking the phone properly, getting them the information they need, right? And if you follow these steps, that you should be comfortable asking for the sell. It, it, I think, and I theorize that sometimes we don't ask for the sell because we think that there's something outstanding, like. We like it's kind of like listening in a little bit, and you kind of hear that there's maybe a bit of hesitation. What is in that? What is causing that hesitation? And if we don't know, we should ask. I, I'm very, and, and it's like let's just let's just remove the vulnerabilities and say, I hear a hesitation in your voice. Is there a reason, or do you have a is there a question that you might have that I can still resolve for you? And if you if you resolve all of those, then you should be these folks should be very comfortable asking for the sell at that point. Right? And if I'm wrong on that, let me know. But I, I really feel like if you go through the steps, it's asking for the sell. Now, each one of your companies is going to have to define how they ask for the sell. Maybe it's saying, well, how would you like to pay for that today? Or I like this one. It's the very soft and subtle, and it doesn't have to be mean or harsh and, or car salesman. You just say, you know, this, I, and you kind of get them in. So you ask the questions, you build their vacation, you kind of get that rapport going, you kind of draw that picture out of how their vacation is going to be. And they're like, you know what? That sounds really great. 
and you just have to listen. And you kind of get them settled in on something that you have, a product that you have, and then you say, that sounds wonderful. You know what? You're going to have such a great time. We'd love to get this dipped up for you. Um, how would you like to pay for that? And that just cuts right to it. It's not mean. It's not harsh. It's not scary. You, you get them to the point where if they're saying, yeah, you know what? That sounds like a lot of fun. Or if they're saying, man, that's a little too much money, then you go back to resolve concern. It's just a big cycle. You go back to, okay, uh, what's, wh how much money were you looking to spend? And if you're at 1670 and they're like, wow, 1635 is all I had, then you say, you know what, let me see what I can do for you. Or you say, you know what, there's value in this. And there's a reason that this actually is this cost. It's because it's amazing. It's beachfront. You know, all of your neighbors are, you know, all of the folks around you are booked up, and this is the last one. You know, for $35 more, I really think you'll enjoy the vacation, right? Add value in instead of just going to the price discount. But if you can, I'm going to leave this up here for a second because if you complete all the portions of the call, then you should be able to and be comfortable asking for the sale. How would you like to pay for that today? How would you like to get that zipped up? Are you ready? Would you like to book that now? Right? Have you practiced that? Have you had a conversation about that? Because if you ask for the sell, two things are going to happen. They're going to give you the sell, or they're going to tell you they're going to tell you no and why not. And if they, if you know why not, then you can overcome that objection, right? But I'd rather I'd rather lose knowing, I'd rather lose knowing than hope that they just call back. Now there's this other conversation. If if it's not sold, put it on hold. How, how many people have ever heard of that concept? And live rest software certainly allows you to, and I know that others probably do too, some sort of a hold where it says, look, within 24, 48 hours, I'm going to hold this house for you, and then I'm going to call you back about when this hold's about ready to drop off. For instance, and I can't speak to other softwares, but I know live rest, for instance, will send out an email through our CRM, our automated CRM, uh, if it's on hold three hours or, uh, you know, the day of the hold or maybe three days after the hold fell off automatically that says, hey, come back and book with us, or hey, we've noticed you didn't come back and book. Or maybe you have your staff say, hey, these are the five that are on hold. I'm going to call these guys first because those are pretty close to booking process. You went through the sales process with them. So the goal of every phone call, if they're, if they're legitimately interested in booking, it should be sold or hold. If they're asking, they've got to go ask their wife, and they're like, you know what? And you're like, I get that. I, I'm okay with asking your, your spouse or significant other or fellow traveler or guest that they need to go talk to them about it. I get that. This is a big purchase. I understand that. So can we just put it on hold for you and then it's here ready for you so it doesn't get booked by someone else? And then we can start that marketing process once it's on hold also. And then follow up. Follow up diligently. This matters. Some interesting stats here, and you can kind of take a look at these, but 48% of salespeople say they never follow up with a prospect. 25% of salespeople say that they make a second contact and then they stop. 12% say they only make three contacts and then stop. And only 10% of salespeople make more than three contacts. By the way, we've looked at this multiple times in our webinar series. When it comes to web traffic, what we all what we see a lot is people will either book the first day they find you or they'll wait to 12 to plus days to book. So just giving up after five days, no way. We literally see if, if it, and once again, I'm highlighting a, a graph that's not showing. <coughs> but one of the things we find on <coughs> web traffic is if they come, we can track how many days it is until that computer comes back again. <coughs> Google Analytics tracks this. Usually they book within the same day that they visit your website the first time, or they'll wait 12 plus days. So saying that after five days, they're never, you're never going to hear from them again, it's not true. Right? 12 plus days, they'll come back. And so keeping in touch with them, and that's why I love the the live route CRM is being able to continually send out emails based on the lead that you have stored in the system. And then what does it take? 2% <coughs> of sales are made on the first contact. Three are made on the second. Five are made on the third. Ten are the fourth. And 80% of the sales are made on the fifth through the twelfth contact. So you can't give up. You literally just can't give up. Because if you give up, you're possibly losing sales because of it. Only 2% of sales are made on the first contact. I think there's this whole rule that generally people will generally buy something or, or they'll investigate something after they've heard about it seven times, seven different touches, whether that's a phone call or an email or they see your website, seven different touches. Just something kind of really, really interesting to consider. 
So, folks, that is it today. That is our webinar, Five Fundamentals of Closing Bookings Over the Phone. I love this webinar, and, and I really hope that it's been helpful and beneficial to you. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, make notes um, that today we've talked about training as the key, uh, that you must understand the basics. Don't forget to gather information. Overcoming objections, and your goal should be to either close the deal or put the property on hold. And I want to just say, once again, thank you for everyone who's taken some time out of their day. Um, I, like I said, this is a fun webinar for me. We've got a great one coming up in November and December to finish off the year. I can't believe it's already over. It's been a, 2014 has been phenomenal. This webinar series has been phenomenal. You can actually get a copy of this or any of our past presentations at liveres.com slash webinars. And then you also can email me. Um, you can also email me or you can call me. Uh, by the way, here's my phone number. It's 208-639-6107. Or email me at any time for a copy of this or any of our past. I know that people loved, loved, loved our past webinar. And I really want to thank everyone for their very sincere compliments and the very nice things they sent in and, and said uh, over the past couple of weeks, over the past webinar and this one also. Uh, you guys are so wonderful and so sincerely nice about this. Last week, last month, we did guest retention. And uh, it went very, very well. So is there any questions? I'd certainly love for any questions. Uh, as you can see in the toggle box, um, you can go ahead and type in your questions, and then we can kind of go through those one by one and answer any, um, any questions you guys have um, about today's topic, closing bookings over the phone. So feel free to type in questions. And as we're doing that, I just want to say thank you again for all the very kind things that you guys have said and are saying. I don't know why you guys are so nice, um, but but we do this webinar series because it, it really is. We just want to help the organization, the industry, continue to push the concept of vacation rental um, and really expand growth. So, um, so I want to tell everyone thank you very very much for the time. And um, for those of you who don't know already, we'll be putting out a press release about this um, tomorrow. So this is probably the first time we'll be talking about this publicly. Um, but I'll go ahead and mention also is that um, in two weeks is the VRA, VRMA annual conference, and we can't wait to see all of you there and hope to see you guys there. Um, they, one of the things that we will certainly see there is in San Diego, so if you have any questions about that, feel free. I just wanted to let you guys know that I am also um, running for the VRMA, VRMA board, and I would cer certainly appreciate any support, um, and, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to vote from there. Uh, if you're a VRMA member. And so I certainly want to tell everyone thank you very, very much uh, for your time today. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to type those in. Um, okay, so here's here's a question. Um, let's see if we can grab that. And any other questions, feel free to type them in. We'll have some fun here. Could you give us an example of the second contact? Just wanted to know the line of nagging versus selling. And selling. You know, uh, Carolyn, that's a really great question because you kind of go through it and maybe let's say that you go through the process and you're like, you know, We'd love you to book. Thank you. And then you don't really hear from anyone. And then you don't hear from them. So it's a couple of days later, and you're and you need that second contact. So what do you say? Well, I think I think I personally like to go about things very calmly. Whether it's an email, for instance, once again, and, and software some do. Live rest does. And I, I I can't speak to others, but we send out emails uh, based upon timing. So like for instance, maybe two days after. Um, a lead, we could say, hey, we haven't heard from you. We just want to check in and see if you had any other questions and what we could possibly do to help you get this um, vacation zipped up, right? Something very calm. And I really like kind of going about it. And that, that's my personality instead of saying, hey, you know, we wanted to, you know, you indicated that you wanted to book with us and we haven't heard back. I don't necessarily like that tact. It's, and the accountability tact isn't necessarily the one that I like. I really like to go off of, hey, it was great to talk to you. And, you know, I did a little bit more investigating. I think you're really going to like this. And wanted to see if we could get this zipped up. If there's any other questions, please let me know. And that could be via phone call. And sometimes those phone calls are like, hey, I haven't heard from you in a day or two. You know, I know that we talked about possibly this and wanted to let you know that, you know, this home's still available. And we're just kind of tightening up our schedule and wanted to see if you had – made any plans yet that's all and just say you know that's all and and say is there anything else that i could do is there any other questions i can answer for you and then if not i'll let you go and then they'll usually say yeah you know what? i'm thinking about this or i haven't thought about that and so that second that second phone call can be very very helpful right 
And it really, once again, the reason I like follow up is because you should know in a perfect world, you would look at every lead that comes in and say, what happened? If they booked, great. If they didn't book, why? And you'd be able to almost define at the end of the month all the, the reasons you got no's and then how to overcome those objections. Now, I, that's very hard to track all of those reasons for no, but a really good sales organization will keep track of all the no's and what those no's are so they can overcome those no's. And if they're like, no, 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 because I want to stay in the city and all your houses are in the hills, then it, you know, it teaches you that maybe you need to try and go find houses in the city and not in the hills. Keep your houses in the hills, but go get more in the city, right? So any other questions, comments, concerns, feel free. Um, once again, I'll just say thank you. Um, you can visit this uh, um, webinar and all the past ones for this year, which have been excellent, at liveres.com slash webinars, or you can email me directly, t.hurst at liveres.com. And I'd invite you to go back to our website and register for the rest of the webinars for the year. And thank you guys for all of your time today. Have a great day.